Okay, let us get ourselves going again. Sorry for that interruption. Again, we're back at session eight, and today what we're going to be looking at is really uh, things where we can continue to work with parametric structures, but really think more about the surface and the panels on the surface and how we can customize them, creating different patterns, applying images, or just thinking about how to change the parameters to indicate something. Today we're going to keep uh, playing with several fairly whimsical things, just creating sort of uh, mathematical patterns like checkerboards or plaids, things like that, and mapping image colors where we can go ahead and take a look at images and kind of pull those colors across to go through and determine either the color of the panel or, based on the image, change something about the panel uh, parameters, make it thicker or thinner to create like an embossed or a bold effect, something like that. Um, We'll also then go ahead and start thinking about how we can use that a little more productively in that as we think about all our different panels, we can go through and apply, oh, just imagery to them to try and create effects, but we can also start thinking about the panels and how they address uh, different aspects of the environment and use that to change the parameters. The most classic one being we can start thinking about how panels are what, uh, directly or not so directly facing the sun at any point of the day and then change aspects of the panels to respond to that. So you start having dynamic surfaces that go through and adapt themselves as the sun moves through the sky, which is really kind of a very cool aspect of what we're doing with uh, light like buildings these days and what parametric design is so good for. Okay, let's go ahead and I just want to open assignment three and let's hope that it doesn't kind of bomb out this time in terms of getting you going. Uh, and just gonna look at what it is. This is again one of, oh, this is I would say similar to ripples on the pond in the amount of time you put into it. It's really not so hard in terms of what you're gonna do here. This is really more just sort of exercising the idea of grabbing some images and changing panel parameters. So not nearly as involved as the second assignment, but here's the idea. You're gonna go ahead and create some sort of parametric surface, okay, and that could be something that you've done just in Revit where you've gone through and created a surface by kind of sculpting some different lines and then lofting them together to create a surface. Or you can do it in Dynamo, uh, where you're uh, generating some lines using math, or generating some curves using math, and lofting those. We'll look at both those different ways of doing things today. Okay, but you're gonna start out by creating a surface, and then on top of that surface, what you're gonna do is panelize it. So create a wall surface, subdivide it. <laughs> what was that? surface into adaptive panels that we've been playing around a lot with, just going ahead and gridding it, kind of making quads out of the different grid points, then ultimately applying adaptive panels to that. That's pretty easy in terms of what you know how to do so far. What we're going to do is just map those you know, to an image file. And that's what's a little bit different, but we'll show you explicitly how to do that today. Basically, we can take an image file and really just scan points on that image file in a similar sort of grid. So we can grab data points, get some information about the color at those different points, and then based on those colors, use some value, whether it's the hue value or the brightness value, some sort of value, and use that to either uh, just kind of recolor the panel to match the panel, uh, image color that was, uh, or coloring the image at that point, or uh, to change the height of the panel. So that's what it's about. We'll do that for uh, two units. For three units, we'll talk about the ability to mirror or flip the image. And we're gonna find out that's a lot of just list transposing. If you wanna flip something or mirror it, just kind of transposing lists and flipping them. Okay, and then for four units, that's where yeah, we take those values and not just sort of map the color, but we go through and either make them taller or smaller in terms of the thickness of the panels just based on uh, what effect you want. And you can put a little Boolean node in there so you can check true or false, whether you want it to be embossed, debossed, or nothing at all. Okay, so that's it. It's actually not a bad assignment. It's just kind of really more playing around and having some fun. But then it has some fun with it. It's just really, okay, and this is due, what is it, next Thursday. Okay, but this plan, you know, it basically gears you up towards the next step, and the next assignment, what you're gonna do is take a parametric structure again that you design, and then start adapting the panels based on things like the sun orientation and the solar insulation you collect. Okay, so this is just all 
playing around with panel parameters. So, any questions about that? No, it's actually it's it's pretty easy and kind of fun, and you'll see what we do in class. Just kind of really, like like with ripples on the pond, it kind of gets you ninety percent of the way there. So it's really more I think of it as kind of a good practice exercise. Okay, super. In terms of what we're going to do today, I want to go ahead and start by returning to that whole resizable shelter. Um, so we can go through and look at oh example eight point two, which is really very similar in terms of adding panels to a surface. In fact, eight point two. I'll start with 8.2, then we'll go back to 8.1. I'm shifting my mind around a little bit. 8.2 is very directly what you're going to be doing in assignment. It's basically panelizing a surface. So let's just start with that. But then we'll talk about how we can do that two different ways. And I think uh, as you were working on the last assignment, a lot of people approached it that way. So let me go to 8.2 as a starting point. So I'll go back over to Revit. Can I hang out over here? Let's see if I can bring that up. In Revit, what we're going to do is uh, open up that example. First, we'll open up the Revit family. The Revit project. I can't remember which one it is. I think it's probably, it, mm, I'm guessing it's going to be a project. Let's talk about that again. You can do most of the things what you, that you do in Dynamo either to Revit families or projects, and it doesn't really matter a whole lot. Okay, you can sort of adapt things in the family to put into a project, or I do it right, right the project. No, well, how do you know um, if it's a project or a family? Because this what this file says dot rvtfn. What what would the dot the rvt is a project? Okay. okay, and rfa is a family. Okay, and sometimes we'll adjust things within the family, then place it in the project, where you're sort of adapting the component and then putting it in. And sometimes we just do it at the project level. Mm -hmm. Kind of works either way. Let's go ahead and here I open and I'll go out to 8.2 and see if we can create some trouble for ourselves. So 8.2, adding panels to a surface. I believe this is a Revit project which has a family inside of it. Okay, let's take a look. surface kind of hanging around in here. And again, this surface could have been created a couple of different ways. This could have been created like a lot of us did for the last assignment by defining some curves geometrically and then saying lock the surface. We can do it that way. I'll show you that in just a second. But this one was created the second way, which is really if you just go and choose that family and say edit it, you'll see it was done by putting in some reference points and curves that connect them, and then lofting them together. So you can sort of see here what's happened in the family is I have three little curves right here. I have a curve right here, I have a curve right here, and on that point. And what I actually do is loft those different surfaces together. And that's what we can do math uh, programmatically, or you can do it manually in Revit. How that got created, again, is I did something like this. Let me just take out the surface so you can sort of see what it is. There's the underlying curves. These are reference points that are kind of hanging around in here. So if I have those different reference points and I can pull them around, okay, super, I can re-loft some sort of surface between those. Okay, so I can reshape it just by moving those points. I'm going to go back and get that point. I'm going to push it back down and get a look. I can pull it over a little bit to the left or right. Now, you can sort of think about really which way is easier. At some level, whether you define that all in Dynamo and created three lines, or you did this in Revit and had them just manually pushed and pulled around, it's about the same difference. It's really whatever you think is easier to control. When I'm sort of sculptingly, sculpting fluidly and just pushing and pulling, I tend to do it this way. When I have a mathematical equation that's driving everything, I'll tend to do it in Dynamo and kind of create the lines that way. Okay. So you just go create reference point, and you just created nine. How did you create those lines? Yeah, oh, these are, let me show you. In the family, you can go through, and this is that whole thing about when you're doing reference points or not. Like, reference points only exist in families. They don't exist in the project. But if you put some reference points on, 
let me do this. I'll put them just on the lower level, on level one right now. And I'll drop them down on the floor. Okay, so they're kind of hanging around down on the floor right now. Let me go ahead and I'm going to pull that one up a little bit. Okay, and you can do it this way where you place points and then I do a reference line. What these lines are, I believe, are splines. So they're these guys spline through the points as opposed to through the control points. Actually, some of this will start sounding familiar to you because it's the same language that you see in Dynamo. It's either a curve through the points or a curve through the control points. Okay, and this is a curve through the points. So this will be a curve that actually goes right through all three of those. Uh, let me see if I can grab it. These reference lines, those are the ones that you can like snap to when they're in a project, right? Correct. And their weakness or their strength. Actually, I shouldn't have pulled it up. Let me do this. I'm just going to do it the other way. I'm just going to make the spline by putting the points down. Okay. And then I can go back and grab the point. And pull that up. Because a reference line has reference points that define it. Exactly. So whether it's a spline or an arc or a circle. Doesn't matter. It's all it has, still. It has, it has reference points and reference lines. Exactly. That oh, and so those would be the midpoints, so those would be the triangles. Or these are really the, the placement points that are defining the curves. Within that, though, when we subdivide it, we can divide these lines anywhere, you know, in any pattern. It's just going to create a, you know, a surface there. So really, those are just all about reshaping. So now I have a four line surface now. If I want to make a surface out of all these, I'll just choose that one. I'll control click and get that one, get the third one, and even get the fourth one. And when I say create a form, it'll loft a surface. Now, that is, for some of us who played around and we're doing it the surface way as opposed to doing it the points way, what we did when we took your list of curves and we said surface, or, yeah, surface like a loft by curves, or, yeah, that's exactly what it's doing. So same sort of way. You can sort of approach it either way. The, again, if we do it this way, it's a little harder to control the points. I can sort of sculpt the points by manually pushing and pulling, but it's harder to do mathematically. So I can add some parameters in here and try to drive it that way. In fact, I can. If for this family, I wanted to give myself the ability to kind of push and pull that point up, okay? It has this offset right now of 42, and that 42 is a, a fixed value. If I wanted to make that a parameter so that when I was working with this, I can say, choose this surface and change that parameter, okay, I can do that. How that works is if I want to relate this to a parameter, I can sort of click that little button and say, this is going to be, oh, this is going to be my middle point height. I'll let that be an instance parameter so I can change it in every one. And then for that, since it's now a parameter, I could actually change that and make it 50 or 60 or 70, whatever I want to do. So at some level, that is very similar to when you have the X, Ys, and Zs and you're dragging the sliders around. Because really, it's just moving points that in turn are adjusting curves, which in turn sort of go through and adjust the surface. Okay, so that's where we get our surfaces from. We just gotta go through and do that. But again, we can do this either this way or we can do it by lofting the surface, you know, out of the dynamo curves. All right, so let's just kind of leave that one hanging for now. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load this into my project. Okay, because families get loaded in. I'm gonna overwrite the existing one, so you'll see it looks a little different now. There it is. There's my new improved surface. This surface, if you choose on it, does have that parameter, though. There is my midpoint height. So if I want to make that 40 again, it'll get you know, dippier. If you want it to get uh, higher, you can go ahead and uh, make it higher. Sometimes we'll use surfaces like this. For example, if you have an undulating roof, if you're doing the California Academy of Sciences, and you're going to go through and create this seven hills of San Francisco roof, it might be nice to create it as a family like this and just kind of have that separable 
so that you can manipulate it independent of the whole project and just insert it as a block. Okay, so there's some, a niceness about sort of separating things out into families. Just kind of uh, lets you kind of break down the problem a little bit. Okay, but we got a surface here, and once you have a surface, how you operate on it is fairly similar. So here we got the surface hanging around. Let's go ahead and you got surfaces up for you? Okay, great. Let's go ahead and grab a, go ahead and open up Dynamo and we'll go to add-ins and we'll talk about how if you have a surface and that's a surface that we can either select because we have in um, Revit or a surface that we generate in Dynamo. Either way, we have a surface, how we can subdivide it. Okay, so a Dynamo opening and let's see what happens here. Let's go ahead and open. Oh, 8.2. Let's start with 1A. So in our typical scheme, what we're going to start by doing is just selecting the surface. We're going to go out and grab something. Then after we grab it, we're going to sort of do something where we're going to break it up into some sort of grid spacing. We're sort of getting used to that notion. Okay, and then going through and putting some points at that one of uh, those parameters. Okay, those points then can get quadded, and then you know panels can get applied to them. So let's go ahead and follow that uh, thread through first. I'll zoom on up a little bit. It's going to start with again just grabbing the surface. Okay, so I can grab the surface here. If I had the surface computed, I would just feed it in from here. But I'm going to say change, go out and grab the surface. Okay, and now it has some face right there, an element ID. Okay, so we selected it that way. But once we have that surface, we are great to go. What we're going to do is say, let's take that surface, and we're going to break it into some sort of a UV grid. That's going to be surface point and parameter. And the parameters we're going to use are going to be a series from 0 to 1 again, sort of normalized. This one's going to have six points. This one's going to have seven points. But again, we can change these sliders to change these two different series. So it'll just have a different number of intermediate points. But go ahead and pull that out. We'll take that surface. We'll take the u and v values, or u and v series of parameters. Okay, And that actually goes through and creates a lot of points for you. So let me go ahead and run this. And we'll take a look at what those points look like. In theory, what's going to happen is back over here on the U's and V's, we're going to get a bunch of values 0 to 1 with all the intermediate points. When we say surface and we put them on there, it's going to compute the X, Y, Z coordinates that correspond to those U's and V's. Okay, so let me kind of just zoom back out here on my surface. There's my surface. You can sort of see all those points hanging around on it right now. Here's my surface. Going to rotate that around a little bit. Super. Get back to the nodes. So you can sort of see we're looking pretty good. And if you want to go through and change that, you want to say that it is, oh, you know, 8 by 7 or whatever it is, just go through and change that. And when you rerun that, the point should update. Okay, we have some new UV points over there. So that's actually pretty good. That's what we've been doing so far. Once we have that surface and we have those points as we want to panelize things, a couple of things we can do. One thing we can do is we can take that surface and we can break it up into a number of points for placing a truss or a beam or something like that based on the number of points. So over here in this lower section, which I'm not going to use right now, this is all about when you take that surface, break it into like groups of three or point, you know, three points. So if I was going to place a uh, four-point truss, this would go through and, so it's like zero to one, three points, no, a three-point truss, that would go through 0 0.51, it would give us some points there. I'm going to ignore that path right now, just focus on the surface, not on the beams. Okay, but let's go ahead and take a look. So, I got my surface, the question is, what do we do next? And what we are going to do is take these points, let's take a look at them. You'll see these points are all arranged 
in kind of rows and columns, what happens is the first break is the row, and then the second break is the column. And with the talks that I'm going about which direction that's going in, it kind of depends on how you're oriented on the project. And what we're going to do is quad them. I'm actually going to quad them. It's funny, this is, I've learned, at least in the latest iteration of how they do this. We don't need to flatten the list first. What we actually need to do is quad the points, and then we'll flatten the quad points. Okay, so that's something that's kind of changed in the way this has all been put together. I'm going to get rid of that for right now. Because really what I just need to do is quad the points. Now, what quadding does, of course, is it takes those rows and columns and it returns these little subgroups of four points. So let's take a look at it. I'm going to run it. See what I got here. It says empty list. That doesn't look very good. That looks good. Quad from rectangular grid. Did I run? I'm saying running, but it's not doing anything. Let's see if it does anything on your side. No, I'm empty. You're empty too. What is wrong with this? We might have to go through and I'm just going to take a look at this again. It's a list of a list. Oh. I am going to yeah, take that back. OK. A little undo action, control Z, control Z. I'll tell you why we do need that after all. It turns out this surface point of parameter actually has one more uh, layer of hierarchy in it. You'll see there are the individual points, and there's the row of the points. And it's actually an upper level, even still, because I could feed it multiple surfaces. OK. so. We're going to get rid of that. I could do this by either, I could say, because this list which really only has one item because I only fed it one surface. Okay. So there's only one item in there at the highest level. Okay. For that, I could go through and expose yourself. That sounds awful. <laughs> Show your data values. That sounds better. Okay, uh, I could say, <laughs> Get item an index and get item an index zero, or I can flatten it. Either way, it'll sort of work. Okay, so I'm going to flatten that list. Okay, now this list flattened, we should have um, all those points. I mean, run it. Okay, without the higher level, now I can quad that. Okay, super. I've got groups of four points. Groups of four points are fantastic. As soon as I have groups of four points, although they're still in a list, okay, I'm going to flatten that out because these groups of four points, they are quads in every row. Okay, so there's a bunch of rows in there. I'm going to flatten that down so I have groups of four points, four points in a flat list, and then work with that. So I can flatten that list and then make these adaptive components. I can put my little aperture panel in there, and we are ready to go, because when you do those two things and put it all together, okay, that then, so I have some little error here. We'll see what's going on. That looks like a nice flat list. What are you complaining about? Warning, the arguments have issues failed. And why are you failing? Mine's OK. Yours OK? I put an unhandled exception. Well, that's probably just. <laughs> oh, looks like it's trying to do something here. Adaptive component by points, a bunch of nulls. Let's just kind of think about this. Mine has family aperture. Okay, so you've got a bunch. You're doing yeah. good. Yeah, like a bunch of crisscrosses. Or Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, when this happens, different things sort of can be going on. Sometimes what I note is this is what I, looks like it's just sort of behaving in a broken way. What I will do is I'll replace the node. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let me go through and I'll just type in adaptive components by points and get that again. I just passed it in without flattening it and it seems to have worked. But I'm it worked for you? Yeah, but when I didn't flatten the list, it applied the point. Let us just kind of think about this in terms of why it is or isn't working. Because the flatten list should be okay, but I'll go think about it. It's got the quad points. Yeah, it works after you delete it and put it back. After you put it back in? Yeah. 
Okay, this is looking a little bit better for me just in that it's taking a while, and I think that while that it's taking is usually that it's going off and kind of doing things. Let's go take a look at it in the background and see what it did. Okay, I do have those. Okay, that's not looking too bad. So I think in the scheme between all the different versions that have changed, that node just got broken. Yeah. So I can pull that node back down in here. Now, if you're still getting the unhandled exception, Jordan, I would probably just either try restarting it or even move to a different machine. There's something sort of broken because, and this is that funny thing where, you know, I, I wish everything were more stable, but it's definitely a little experimental and sort of along the edges, occasionally it breaks. Okay, so let's see if you can get something that looks like that. How are we doing? Amir's doing good? Ms. Britt, how are you doing? Looking good? Front row gang? I'm good. Okay, good. Okay, excellent. Now, this whole way of doing it is actually kind of a really kind of cool way. It sort of works pretty well. That's sort of a very standard way. But honestly, this whole chunk of code that goes and you take the points, you break it into the surface point by parameter, you flatten it, you quad it, blah, 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 you know, all that type of stuff, you know, you use it a lot. So it is a perfect candidate for some sort of custom node. Okay, so much so that the people at Lunchbox actually went through and created a custom node. Okay, Lunchbox is a package of all sorts of different nodes that you know, are just designed to go through and provide all sorts of utility functions, things that could work well for us and sort of speed up our work. So it looks like now, let me just read what the error is. It looks like this one that's in there isn't loaded right, but we'll reload the new version. I tried installing it and then it doesn't, when it shows up, it doesn't have surface UV panel points or anything. Actually, that happened to someone else too. Let me and see if I can get this to work. Yeah. It doesn't let me run the program at all. It crashes Dynamo on my well, computer and on this one. That's a whole bunch of badness. <laughs> Let me see if I can get this to work in terms of a newer version. What happens with some of these is that basically as we keep on moving through and updating different versions, things break. So let's see if we can figure this out. Quad grid by face. Let's see if I can find that. That's quads from rectangles. Let me see if I even have the package loaded. Lunchbox is, it looks like I don't have it loaded right now, so let me load it in here again. Um, I think it's just not finding it right now. What we'll do is, I'll go loading it, and we'll see if it works, and if it doesn't, that's okay. It's just really that, you know, somehow the Lunchbox custom nodes are a little out of date with what they need to be. Save it first, could it crash A very good plan. Let me save as, I'll save as 1A2, just so we have it out there. And let's do this. So whenever I want to load in some packages, we last time loaded the quads from rectangular grid. I'm going to search for a package. It's going to start with this really slow, oh, I got to sync with the server. It's going to take a few minutes to do that. Actually, that wasn't so much. Okay. So I'll say Lunchbox, see if I can find Lunchbox out here for Dynamo. Now, it's interesting. There's two different versions there. That kind of makes me wonder, this quad grid by face, it looks like it kept the old one around, it looks like it updated this one. Oh, this is the whole package. I'm going to try downloading this one because I sort of suspect that the one that's in here got broken. And that the bottom one's one. broken. This one's broken? Yeah. It, so, you think they're both broken? I haven't tried the top one, I only like tried the bottom Okay, one. let's try the top one. What do you think? I'll say, download that, let's go ahead and install it. Downloading, we'll see if it'll install. <laughs> if you're downloading and installing and you need any uh, kind of access privileges, if I ask you, I don't think it will, but it does. That's your login and your password. For changing that. <laughs> Again, that's the password for these computers, right? The yes. admin? Yeah. yeah. I used it. Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 okay. So let's see what we got here. I got a lunchbox right here now. Let me see if I can say the quad grid. Oh, actually, it looks like it sort of found it. Yeah. Let me just try it over there. OK. I have those UVs. Why don't you try loading? I'm going to take that out, and we'll try putting it back in there again. I'll remove that. And I'll say quad grid by face. OK. 
Looks like it may be there. But again, there's probably a version control thing. See if you can get it to yeah, come up on yours. Yeah, mine popped up. It said the following packages are use a newer version of Dynamo than you are using. Ah. So do I want to continue? Not for the first either. one? Yeah, for the first one. Continue. I'd continue. Okay. Okay. But all this one does, it's a little bit different, is let's take a look at what it's up to. It's got a very subtle difference, but it's a really good package. In fact, if you really want to look at what's inside there, you can click on it and say, let's edit that node, take a look. Inside of that Lunchbox node, well, there's some list matching stuff. That's some little custom stuff they put together with a Python script. Eh, they're really doing it kind of in the background for you here, so you can't really see very much. We're going to learn how to write little Python scripts, which do things that uh, we can do in Dynamo, but do it in often a more efficient way using the Python programming language. If you even double click on that or edit that, you can sort of see what the Python is underneath all this. You can say edit this, and you'll see that somewhere buried alive underneath of all this programming that we've been doing visually, there's actually a little function here for quadding things and then ultimately going through and creating some panels. But we'll do more about that later. For now, we'll just kind of think about how to use this node. Now, as you hover over the node, you sort of see it wants a surface, it wants a U and a V, but let's talk about this. The U and the V that it wants is a little bit different. Okay, what it wants is, it doesn't want the whole UG series, what it wants is the surface, and then it wants to know the number of panels. Okay, not the number of points, but the number of panels that it wants. So, what I'm gonna do is to use this thing, Come back over here. We'll still feed it our surface. For the U, what I'm going to do is take these values. These were the number of points, the panel points. I'm going to subtract one from each of them, because that would actually give you the number of panels. So I'll take that 8. It'll give me 7 panels in that direction. I'll take that 7. It'll give me 6 panels in that direction and plug those in. Now, what this node returns, which is actually pretty good, is really three different things. We can return the panel points, the points around the quarters of the panels, which are those quad points that we like to work with. We can also turn, uh, return polygons, which are little uh, four-sided surfaces that uh, connect. We can also choose the faces that are generated by those four points. So we can get the boundaries, we get the faces, or we get the points at the corners. Any one of those. So it's a pretty useful function. But the net effect of using that function, if you go through and run it, is that it is going to go through and basically do this gridding. It's going to do the surface point parameter. It's ultimately going to go through and give you the quads right there. Okay. So what I can do here is take these panel points. Let's just take a look at these. I'm even going to do a little watch so you can sort of see what is returned. If I choose into the panel points, you will see this actually looks an awful lot like what that was returning. Okay, it's just the quads, although I mean, still have to flatten it because it's a list of all the surfaces, the quads within those surfaces. So this could really just be plugged in right there. So it saves you a little bit of kind of action here. But I guess my point in all this is that there's always like four or five ways to do things. There's never kind of a single way. And it's really just kind of depending on what you're familiar with. I now, it's an empty list. Yeah, I will. Okay, so somehow, what are you bringing in over to it? We're seeing these and these in surface. Yeah, should we, should we reload in the surface maybe? Um, it should still be there, but you, and you read it. Yeah. And you're watching the panel points? It's just something going on that's goofy. Let us see. Oh, I reloaded oh. the surface. Did you reload the surface? No. 
Oh, mine's not empty. Just kidding. Okay, let's take a look. We need to connect six and seven. So, oh, and we're, and for the surface, you're doing all there, and you're so going. You, oh, I did it from pan yeah, me too. Ah, yeah, got it. Yeah. Okay, there, there we go. Because, yeah, what it wants is just a integer. It doesn't want the series. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, now it's all green. Beautiful. Okay, so it's just another way of doing it. Now, this whole idea of doing, uh, like, using the lunch box function, it's, it's good from the standpoint that it sort of saves some time. <coughs> useful function for you to use. If you do go through and distribute your code to other people, though, you have to let them know, oh, by the way, you need a lunchbox. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's going to have a hole in there. You can kind of take that lunchbox node, you can save it as, and save it inside your folder, and then when you pass the folder to them, they'll find it because it's in the same folder. Mm -hmm. okay, but you always have to watch out to make sure that everything that your map depends upon is all in there, so you can find it pretty easily. Okay, so great. You go on over there, you create those sort of aperture panels. Either way, I just want to sort of drive on the point that either way will work. Okay, and then after you have those aperture panels, super, you come on down here, you do the adaptive component, you get a list of panels, and you're in pretty good shape. Okay, so <laughs> this is one way of doing it, is to go through and take the surface to create the points. To, I'll contrast that with the other way we did it was, you know, we went through and we just took a bunch of points and we did curves and put points on the curves. In either case, what was necessary to make it all work was though we needed to have a whole bunch of points that were a rectangular grid on that, whether it was a series of curves where we transpose the points or whether it's a surface and you break it down to put the panels on the surface. Either way, sort of works. Okay, so I'm just going to leave it at that for now there. Let's go ahead and do one other thing, and that is this whole notion of the surface. I'll revisit 8.1, which is where we were last time, in terms of that funny, wavy surface with a scalloped edge and stuff like that. And just talk about the whole issue. If you wanted to do it the surface way, as opposed to doing it the point way, how it would work there, too. Because I can create surfaces like a, just a within Dynamo. So let me save my changes. I'll say no to that. Here's the deal. I think especially when I was working with Amir, he had a, a very interesting surface where there were all sorts of curves, but really he'd already built all his logic off the notion of selecting a surface and subdividing it. So even though we generated a bunch of curves, the best thing to do was really to use his logic to just sort of take those curves and make them into a surface, because then he could use the surface logic from there forward. Okay? And you can do that too. So let me kind of show you how that works. And Example 8.1. So 8.1 is really where we left off last time. We'll do that shelter with the resizable ribs. So again, create a surface by generating a family and pushing and pulling the points there, or create a surface by generating a bunch of lines that you determine mathematically, or in the dynamo geometry, you go from there. So as you might remember, we sort of ended up with this structure last time. It has that kind of scallopy edge on the end that was based on our sine wave. But you might remember that this surface is really generated by a whole bunch of different curves, or these panels are being placed by putting a whole bunch of different curves in. The curves are always going from a starting point, a high point, to an end point, where the end point followed some sort of sine wave. Okay. But if I want to turn that into a surface, I can. And how you do that is as follows. We'll go back and say add-ins and open up Dynamo again. And let's open up the script for all this. What we're going to do is we're going to find the spot where all those curves are defined, that list of the 12 curves or 8 curves or whatever it is. Okay and then loft those. So I'll say open. Let's go out to, it's back in 8.1. Open that graph. Now this graph, I'll apologize, I didn't clean up. This is kind of the way we left it last time as we were going on the fly. But we'll see if we can find that spot in the graph. It's a great example of why it's really helpful to put your groups in place. Because otherwise, you pass it off to someone else and they go like, oh my. This looks messy. Let's see if we can figure it out. <coughs> okay. A lot of opening. Why does she not 
slash is about five times as much as yours does. I think that's something we're going to hear you think of. It's a funny screen refresh of the culture guy. Where's the splash up the storm there? If you already have it open, go digging around in there and see if you can find a spot where we have those like eight different curves. What it was is we took the four curves, the two or the two straight lines and the sine wave curve, and then we divided them into points, and then we transposed and made the nerves curves in the other directions. So let's see if we figure that out. Kind of splash up storm now. Someday. Well, splashing, that's good. painful to watch. It's like watching paint dry. Actually, that might be more exciting. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to let it keep going, and then we'll do it. Arr, what's going on? Computer, don't fail me now. There we go. Phew. Okay, so let's see if we can find where all this is. You might remember we went through somewhere in here. I'm seeing my <laughs> waves here. I'm mapping some waves. At some point, I'm taking several different items. Uh, this is the point where I have the three different curves. I have the two straight lines, and I have my sine wave curve. I brought them all together here. Okay, so this is the three curves, and this is curve points at parameter. Okay, so. This is where I subdivide them into curves. I transpose them. I think it's right about here where I get myself into uh, what I'm looking for. Let's see if we can figure this out. So somewhere right about in her, I say that I'm going to take these different curve points of parameters. This is the three different curves. okay, And then I transpose it. What that went ahead and did is it made groups of three. So this is making the curves that run from front to back. So from the base all the way up to the sine wave. Okay, those are those points. Okay. And even right here, I did some nerve curve by points right there, where that drew them. Let me go ahead. I'm going to turn off my adaptive beams. I'm just going to turn them off for right now. I'm just going to follow that forward. So I'll just turn off those adaptive beams just so I'm not generating them. That'll speed it up a little bit. So here in the background, the big issue was if I took those transpose lists and I said, let's do a nerves curve by points, it created all these curves going this way. So even if you want to take a look at that, you can say if you take that off for right now and regen it, or you put it back in there, lifts transpose, you'll see that actually gives us, it's the nerves curves that come across. Let me go back in to Dynamo again. You crashed Dynamo on me. That's still there. Okay, so now I have the nerves curves in there. So here's the deal. If I have a whole group of curves, and whether I generate those curves mathematically or I drew them manually, whatever it is, I can go ahead and create a surface out of that. And here's how you do it. I'll just get rid of this node. That's not doing me any good right now. What you're going to use is the ever popular surface by loft. A lot of you went through and found that function. And surface by loft just wants a series of curves. Now, if you went through and had a bunch of reference lines, what you had to do, a lot of you discovered, was you had to dereference them. You had to say curve element dot curve, which said, I'm going to get the curve from Revit, and I'm going to dereference, I'm going to pull out the dynamo geometry, the geometry which defined that curve over Revit. Kind of looks very, very similar. 
and we use those because this wants a series of curves in geometry. It doesn't want a series of curves in Revit. Okay. But if we're just hanging around here in Revit, what you can do is just take that list of curves and plug that right in. Okay. You don't need to dereference it because it already is a dynamo geometry curve. Okay. And lock those. So let's just kind of give you a sense of what that looks like. And to do that, how about this? I'm even going to remove this whole uh, part over here where I break the curves. It's going to pull that on down. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take my curves. You can actually sort of see if you highlight our here on. If I highlight the node, you'll see that the curves actually show up in blue over there. They're kind of hanging around over here looking blue. If I say surface loft those curves, you can actually create a smooth surface between them. Now that's pretty cool because if you have that smooth surface between them, now you can go ahead and use the surface panelization as opposed to doing the panels directly based on the points. So it gets you about to the same place. Okay. But there is a small advantage to doing it this way. So let me talk about that ever so briefly. Over here, yeah, looks like I haven't previewed my surface. But let's talk about why there's a small advantage to this. That surface is actually kind of nice in that it has kind of these relatively smooth kind of boundaries to it. So let me kind of zoom in over here and kind of show you what I mean, and then we'll take a break. That was a little bit too much. Let's go back up. Okay. You might notice that if you look between the different defining curves, for example, between this one and that one, there's actually a little curvaceous surface in there, and that's kind of nice. 